Muchas gracias, Íñigo, por la presentación y Íñigo y Eduardo por invitarme a hablar en esta sesión magnífica. Um, voy a cambiar el inglés para seguir en el espíritu de la sesión que es todo en inglés y porque además, como ha dicho Íñigo, me resulta más fácil uh, presentar este material en inglés. All right. Um, so thank you everyone uh, for coming here. Uh, the, in this talk, it's going to be split between me and Ander Ramos. Um, so the purpose of the first half is just to walk you a little bit about the grounding work that made up uh, half of this collaboration. So I met Ander in Buenos Aires in a conference in 2010, and we decided that it was a good idea to start a clinical trial in Spain in close loop BMI. At that time, it was not clear whether it was one of his stroke or spinal cord injury or, or what. Um, but it, we knew we want to do it there, and we actually were blessed to work with a, a phenomenal uh, team of uh, scientists, clinicians, and engineers. So I want to specifically mention uh, uh, all the work that Eduardo Ramos did and Inigo Pomposo as well to make this happen. And of course, uh, joining the gang from day one was uh, uh, Neil Spierbaumer. And I want to start with this, giving credit to him, because you know, in, in this field, we all stand on the shoulders of giants. And for me, really, and especially for my research, uh, has been inspired from the beginning by two individuals, F. Fetz and Niels Birbaumer, from the fantastic work. To give a talk in front of Niels is always a, a pleasure. And uh, so I, I want to um, give uh, him credit also because he made uh, this, uh, especially in the early days with no funding uh, in this endeavor that Ander and I started. Uh, it was backed from the very beginning by Niels, not just scientifically, but financially, which is very important, and of course also by Technalia and, and others. So. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm gonna go back in time for a few years. Uh, this is the work I was doing during my postdoc with Miguel Nicolelis back in 2003. Uh, at that time, um, the goal was to show that, or to test whether actually the mammalian brain, and in this case, the non-human primate brain, uh, is able to attain volitional control of neural activity in the absence of a uh, physical movement. So these are not paralyzed monkeys like the very impressive work that we just saw in, in the previous talks by Jocelyna Gregoire. These are healthy animals, uh, yet uh, with these animal models, we, are, we, we can do a lot of things uh, in the sense of testing about uh, the plastic properties of the brain and, and how can uh, the primate brain actually can learn to control disembodied devices that eventually humans, as has been shown, can do too. Uh, so, sorry, I should have activated this. What you see in these videos is uh, I, at, that at that time was uh, one of the first demonstrations of a closed loop control. So in this case, the animals are learning to make their neurons in the motor cortex and other cortical areas fire in such a way that uh, they will make a decoding algorithm, make, generate uh, control signals, and get better through time. So the, this last part is a key, right? Learning by adjusting the frame rates of the neurons. And the, the, what facilitates that is the neurofeedback principle that uh, Ebb and Niels were working so many years ago. Um, so uh, among other things on those, in these studies, so what you see in these videos are animals learning to, like this, anim this monkey, for example, in the top left, has their arms resting on the plate and is learning to control that little cursor to hit that target just with neural signals alone. And there are other cases where we introduce robots to add more disturbances and oscillations and make tasks harder, like reach and grasp and so on, okay? But the, the important thing is that they learn these new skills. Um, I'm going to fast forward now to uh, present time and basically summarize in, in two main challenges the, the, the field. And specifically now, I'm talking about upper limb control, okay, which is so incredible work on locomotion. Uh, we're focused on upper limb control. Uh, just from shoulder to fingertips, there's about 24 degrees of freedom. This is extremely complicated. Uh, system. It took evolution millions of years for the first little animals to evolve from reaching with their neck to actually reaching to control the limb for a reason. And if any of you have robotics background, you will know about inverse dynamics and inverse kinematics problem. And for 24 degree of freedom, it will be like several textbooks of uh, equations just to solve that problem. It's a really complicated ill post problem. Um, so, okay. Going back to these challenges, what is preventing us from having this technology deployed at the level of like what will be uh, like one of these booths outside, right? Companies 
selling these products because clinicians can actually prescribe them, right? So having clinically viable solutions that last decades, if not the whole lifetime of the patient. So that, that's what I like to talk about challenge one, which is specifically about the neurotechnology, what you put in the brain. Okay, what are the problems with that? Well, the none of those technologies are uh, designed to last. These were research tools, like the, the one that Niels showed in his talk, this so-called Utah Ray, for example. These were uh, actually devised for, for animal experiments that last a few years in the brain maximum, and they, they degrade for, as you can see in this slide, a variety of biotic and abiotic factors, but not only that, but that's a, a big one. So material science is a big problem in, in, in this challenge. But it's also, of course, about science and energy, right? You want to have this, like a very small device, and you want to have it wireless, and you want to power that thing deep in the brain if you're interested in having a new modulator for Parkinson's, for example, and so on. And there are many reasons why you cannot do that with standard uh, traditional technologies like what you, you see in a, with, uh, using electromagnetics, like a radio frequency, for example, because you will require a huge coil for that. And then, yes, if you can put a big can like a pacemaker, sure, you can do that. But if you want to have that fully implanted in the subthalamic nucleus uh, at the size of a grain of salt, not the salt, but a grain of rice, for example, then that's going to be impossible. Just the physics are not there. So uh, this is what uh, my partner in crime, uh, Michelle Maharvitz, and I and a couple of colleagues more in Berkeley, about eight years ago, we came up with this vision for a technology platform that we call Neural Dust. And it was originally meant to be a solution for this problem I just mentioned, right? Uh, this chronic, um, long-lasting, wireless, tetherless, et cetera, uh, devices that, from, uh, that you could use to record neural activity, what in this case, um, what do you see here? Whoa. Let's see. Doesn't show up for whatever reason, no problem. So these little guys here, these are microscopic, like a few hundred microns to a few, uh, tens of micron size, cubic size. Uh, little devices that are passive, no battery, they just get energized with ultrasound and they can send information back uh, in what has been sent in the backscatter. And you can also use this technology actually to stimulate. You can send, send enough energy with ultrasound to actually uh, have literally like a neuromodulator there. Um, just to give you a little bit more information about how this thing works, so what's the magic of this? The magic is simply uh, the physics of ultrasound. With ultrasound, you can go deep in your body with very little amount of energy and talk to very, very tiny little devices and still get information back. And that's simply because we are bags of solar water. So ultrasound was really well through water, and electromagnetics just can't. That's why your phone doesn't work if you just try to use it in, underwater in the pool, whereas ultrasound really goes like a charm. What you see in that cartoon there is basically that you can send some pulse of ultrasound that will energize a little crystal, okay? And the crystal basically can, can have a very simple chip, like an ASIC attached to it, and then, which is biasing and, and polarizing a, a sensor, which in this case will be like two electrodes if you're recording some potential from a neuron. And then that thing that is being recorded is gonna change the impedance, the electrical impedance properties of the circuit, which in, in turn is gonna change the mechanical impedance of that little crystal. So in the backscatter, in the echo, going back, you, are ha you have all this information encoded. So you are powering and communicating with ultrasound. Again, no battery, no, no wires, nothing. And you can go, like, the physics basically tells you you can go as small as 50 micron cube, if you will put this in the brain, and using levels of energy that are way below what the FDA limits are for the brain, for example. But not only the brain, you can use this uh, anywhere in the body as a way to, s to get information out, like oxygen, pH, temperature, pressure. Anything of interest, of course, electrophysiological signals for nerve as well. As well. Uh, and, and as I said before, you can also use it to stimulate. You can pump enough energy with ultrasound to drive it like a new modulator of that size. Uh, hence, because all, all this and the interest that this generated, Michelle and I started this uh, uh, company, we call Iota, Iota Biosciences, and we are both on leave now from Berkeley, uh, pushing uh, and developing this technology for human use in the area of bioelectronic medicine. I'm not going to be talking about that today, uh, but just want to fully declare, I mean, disclose that. Um, okay, so I'm going to go back to these two challenges I was mentioning, what's preventing us from having this technology at the level of what we have outside there for Parkinson's and other, and other uh, disorders, right? So one was what you put in the brain, the technology side of it. And the second one is what can you do with this, right? 
let's say you have your perfect tiny little device that lasts forever and is safer than current technologies and so on, why, why should you bother in, for the BMI, upper limb prosthetics field to have such technology, right? So this is what, in these videos, you see a current ongoing clinical trials in the US. The top one is the BrainGate trial and the one in the bottom is the one from uh, Pittsburgh University. In both cases, uh, the approach is the same. The patient is an ALS patient or a spinal cord injury patient has a Utah array, a black rock array implanted, and they're figuring out how to control those signals through a mathematical decoder to actually uh, drive those fancy robots uh, basically to drink more. <laughs> And the bottom case is a piece of chocolate, okay? So you could, with, he, with this part, you see both what I like to talk about, like the half full, half empty bottle, right? On one side, it's extremely uh, exciting to see these demonstrations that you can see the power of this technology can help a lot of people. At the same time, you can see how crude the performance is, right? How far we are from skillful control. So this is, lumping all these things into one bag, that's what I call challenge two, which could be measured as a metric like, how can you re reduce the caregiver time in one of these patients? How can these patients regain more independence, right? Mobility of their limbs to become independent, to perform tasks of daily living, and so on. So this involves a variety of things, like building better decoders, uh, better robotic devices, and of course, ways to sensorize the device back into the brain, so be able to get like artificial sensory feedback from the robot, and many challenges. Uh, in my lab in Berkeley, we have been focusing on a the part that relates about how the brain adapts to the machine. So we don't have here to go over the studies. I'm just going to mention two uh, fundamental findings. Uh, we conduct research uh, in animal models mainly, so prim non human primates, rats, and mice, uh, using a variety of techniques, electrophysiology, calcium imaging. But what is co in common in all these studies is that um, we're looking at what networks in the brain are needed and necessary to learn new skills. We approach this BMI problem uh, like learning a new skill. Like a baby has to learn how to walk or control their body, right? So the brain of an adult with an injury has to learn how to control this disembodied device in a way, hopefully, that will feel natural. So you can actually control it in a more natural way. And you just saw in the last videos from Gregoire that uh, you know, adding the BMI component presumably will uh, enhance and make that walking <laughs> feel more natural as well, right? So anyway, so the, the two uh, main findings, which this is also preloading for what comes next, right? And let me just say that the two findings I'm gonna be, or principles I'm gonna be describing in, in a couple of minutes, uh, together with all the expertise in clinical work, invasive and non-invasive from Niels and Ander, is what basically made the trial that he's gonna be talking in, a, in, an, in the second part of the talk, right? Like uh, the building blocks of, uh, for our patient for chronic stroke using uh, basically this know-how that we have been acquiring through the past almost 15 years now. Um, so the first principle is what I like to think of uh, as a prosthetic motor memory. It's this concept that the brain, the human and primate, the non-human primate brain can learn um, these represent abstract representations. These are not part of the natural body, right? Controlling an artificial robotic arm has nothing to do like controlling your natural limb, for example. Yet the brain can learn these things and, the, and, and form like a memory that can be recalled like a natural memory in the same way, right? Like when you learn how to drive, you sit in your car and you don't need to recalibrate every day, you just drive, it feels natural, right? So that's the, the whole concept of a recalling a memory that is stable across time and resistant to interference. I'm not gonna get into the details of these data plots, but basically in this study we, we, we show that this the formation or the emergence of this engram or memory in the brain that allows, uh, in a more informal way, plug and play BMI, so neuroprosthetic. You Once the animal has learned the task, the next day, from the very first trial, it's ready to go. It doesn't have to recalibrate. The second principle is like, okay, all this is great, but this is all putting the pressure in the, in the animal's brain, right? So it's, the, it's all about neuroplasticity when the decoder, which is what I, what I have here, is fixed. So this map, this is a math mathematical model, it's like an arbitrary map. It's not important now how this gets created. Happy to talk to you about it if you want later. But the point is that it's changed. It's just like the spinal cord for BMI, right? So that's how my little toy spinal cord, because it's an oversimplification compared to real spinal cords, 
and, and there's a lot of plasticity involved there and many exciting things that you saw in the previous talk. But here, it subserves that role. The brain basically has to learn an inverse model of this box here so they can control this. So in this part, all that pressure is in the brain and is this plasticity that I just mentioned. But what about actually exploiting um, the power of machine learning techniques, right? So if the decoding happens also in the algorithm, now you can leverage this to natural and artificial ways of uh, uh, basically uh, adapting, right? Which have very different time scales of adaptation, learning rules and things, right? So it's tricky, but the goal is to, while keeping the, this corticostriatal plasticity that we have seen as a common indicator of, of the brain learning these, these tasks, and not messing with that, how can we actually boost or accelerate that learning and boost performance? So we, 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 we call that closed loop decoder adaptation, which is in essence how, when, and which parameters of the decoder to get adapted during BMI operation, while, while the animal or the human is actually engaged in learning the task. So it's a true learner system, brain and spinal cord uh, working in tandem. And it, it's a very exciting field. So these are the two uh, main, um, as I said, uh, findings uh, from my lab that we brought to this clinical trial com together with all the expertise and findings from the Birbaumer and uh, Ramos labs. Um, so what I'm gonna, th this ends that part, and if I may for the last three minutes or four, I'm just gonna show you a couple of uh, other examples that use some of these principles uh, in humans and monkeys that we have been working on before uh, basically um, continuing with the actual uh, clinical trial is going on, going on right now in San Sebastian and Bilbao and chronic stroke. So the first thing is this collaboration that we have with Phil Star, which is a, a motor disorder neurosurgeon at UCSF and a great collaborator of ours and uh, also a member of our Center for Neural Engineering and Prosthesis. And Phil, among other things, is a beta tester for Medtronic. So he gets the latest developments of their devices and, and basically uh, tests them in his patients. So, uh, we, he had this idea of what I think we can do, I'm sure we can do with Activa PC plus S device, you know, and we can get enough from it today with the current version, or in this case, three years ago when we tested this, that we could close the loop and do a neuromodulation, or in this case, neurofeedback task. And the interest was basically to, to leverage the fact that there are so many patients at home that could use this, their already implanted device, equipped with a, uh, with, uh, tiny strips of ECOG electrodes and the capacity of um, extracting that data in quasi real time with some latencies which made it challenging uh, to be able to close the loop. And the reason for this, this is, is separate from the stimulator, okay? This is to, you know, th uh, it's a different hypothesis which is about, well, what if you could uh, provide therapy to the patient or beneficial effects by desynchronizing beta frequencies, right, in, in cortex and striatum, for example. So you can train, as, as we, we mentioned, you can get the brain to learn pretty much any abstract uh, transform. So maybe we find a marker that is good for alleviating tremor or to work in tandem with stimulation, and then the patients can openly conditioning uh, uh, learn how to actually do that. So that's the work that Priya in my lab did uh, with three patients from Phil, and she developed this little Mario Bros task in which they, uh, in, the, in, the, in, in their iPad or computer, these uh, participants at home could practice like playing a little video game. And the goal was basically, in this case, to the t uh, what the brain had to do was to subtract the beta power from motor cortex and somatosensory cortex where these electrodes were positioned and in order that with, at, with different levels of strength in order to basically generate different levels of power that will allow them to hit one of these four targets, right? It's like trying to bring Mario to each of the four targets, whichever he's been instructed to do. And what you see in this data slide, in the left you have early in the session, in, in the right late, and how they can learn in 40 minutes to discriminate these four targets. So this is beta power, this is time uh, prior to the reward, so they can actually learn to dissociate these two electrodes, the power in these two electrodes to generate different levels of power. So now with this, this is basically just proof of concept that at home, if there will be a marker or a specific transform that is shown that to be, if it's learned, it could have beneficial effects, this will be a great platform to deploy this at home already without having to go to a hospital with current technology, which is only getting better with the new versions of firmware of, uh, in this case, the, the Medtronic device. Okay, so that was one of the things. The, the second one is just, to touch up briefly in a big area in the US right now, 
which is looking at the uh, mental health, leveraging all this uh, know-how and technologies for closed loop neuromodulation modulation and brain machine interfaces, but not focus now on motor disorders, but more on mental health disorders. And with the premise that the pharmacological model is basically up, not very effective for this, and that we should get into the physiology of these brain networks for each in individual in order to be able to develop therapies. Um, so we're part of this big consortium, this DARPA grant with UCSF, uh, and we were doing the animal part of it there. And uh, I'm gonna skip some details, but I just wanna show you unpublished data from our monkeys uh, in uh, having a model of a, uh, in this case, in a healthy animal, but an acute model for stress or mood disorders, in which the animals are implanted in, in many structures, but specifically we have electrodes deep into the ventromedial PFC and orbital frontal cortex, which have been shown that uh, in Helen Mayberg show actually there that has, among other things, effects for uh, depression in pa patients, but also somehow mood disorders, but it wasn't very clear. So we went there with uh, our monkeys, we trained them to um, perform decision-making tasks. So the animal is very focused on trying to perform like a behavioral task. And we are measuring some physiological parameters and we can measure the stress with that. So in this plot, this is the control showing when the animal is, is basically doing the task normally, you can make the task harder and the animal basically gets stressed by increasing the pupil diameter and the heart rate, right? And you can induce this every day, so it's a reversible model. And then by stimulating uh, in these areas that I mentioned, this is, uh, was uh, Samantha Santa Cruz, a postdoc in the lab, and now is a professor in Austin, and uh, now this is followed by Ellen Sippy in the lab. Um, by stimulating in closed loop in this structure, you can actually induce ancillitic effects. And this is the cloud that you see here now in gray. So this, in this corner is low stress, this corner is high stress. So you can see that stimulation during the stress part of the trial of the task brings actually the performance even more relaxed than the actual control, okay? So it's a very strong, effect there that actually very recently our colleague in our center and also collaborator on PI of this grant, Eddie Chang, and my former postdoc Miriam Shaneke published in humans both the decoding of those mood states but also the, the actually the relief of these depression symptoms, right? It's very, very sensitive to mood disorders. But point being that you can see the, the power of these technologies, right? That in terms of decoding in different points in the network and stimulation, in others, the goal of this endeavor really is, the very ambitious one is to cure the brain, is to unlearn maladaptive conditions by inducing plasticity. And the last slide I have is just now where we are heading also with these new technologies. So this is actually a different incarnation of our neural dust as a neuromodulator. So this little caps capsule, which is as small as you can see in this coin, you could think of this, this, is, this can actually de deliver the stimulation, record neural activity and sense temperature, but you could also equip this with chemical sensors and sense dopamine and other neurotransmitters. So you could imagine this implanted, for example, in subthalamic nucleus and being your, your DBS system interrogated from the exterior with ultrasound. So this is the vision that we have and that we're pursuing in, in Berkeley and our center uh, right now on the academic side and eventually we plan obviously to pursue this in the real world in, in, in the company. So with this, I'm gonna pass the baton to, to Ander. And thank you for your attention. Eh, bueno, muchísimas gracias eh, por la invitación, por la organización. La verdad es que es un placer estar aquí y un orgullo. Y desde luego eh, jugar en casa como parte de la cantera, pues también eh, tiene sus condicionantes. Eh, bueno, yo voy a intentar ahora volver hacia atrás y después de ver este futuro prometedor que tenemos, vamos otra vez a volver a la realidad. Eh, la realidad en este caso es cómo podemos utilizar esto a día de hoy para un ejemplo clínico y una aplicación clínica, parecido a lo que ha hecho Jocelyn antes, sin ser neurocirujano para nada. Eh, y otra vez eh, voy a cambiar el inglés, más que nada para seguir con la línea. Eh, de todas formas, luego vamos a estar aquí, podemos hablar de cualquier cosa en cualquier idioma de los que sabemos. Eh, nosotros nos hemos centrado en el problema del ictus, cómo vamos a utilizar esto y cómo vamos a solucionar el problema del ictus. All right, so the problem of stroke is, uh, is manifolded. When we're trying to rehabilitate stroke, we need to tackle many aspects of it. So the first of, one, the first of them is the motor control. When we have the stroke, the pathway between the cortex and the muscles is, is disrupted, obviously. So the signals do not cross. We saw before, Gregoire, Jocelyn showed the same thing in the spinal cord injury. 
Some drugs are not there, but there are residual pathways. So this is the first one. So how to control, again, the muscles. The second one is because of the injury, there is an atrophy, there is a loss of muscle volume too. And uh, that is also affecting mechanics, tendons. So basically the entire biomechanics is also affected. And that generates spasticity too, which is a mechanism that is quite unknown. So nobody knows exactly what it is. Is it a spinal issue? Is a, is a cortical, subcortical issue? The thing is basically that there is a hyperflexion normally that also induces this um, loss of volume in the muscles, uh, different uh, activities, different connections. And that is actually the last, the last point, which is the connection between the brain and the muscles needs to be coordinated so that we can actually generate movements, functional movements that make sense. All right, so knowing all this, we need to somehow find a way to solve the problem. And we're talking here about brain-machine interfaces, neural interfaces, and how to reconnect parts of the nervous system. So the traditional therapy is quite primitive. It's just physiotherapy, um, different, different, different kind of physiotherapy, like constraint movement therapy. You block the, the healthy arm and try to use the one that you have paretic. But the problem is that this is not effective enough. It works, it's been working for a while, but I think it's time to leverage these new technologies that we have here to see if we can actually improve that. So the new alternatives are robotics, some functional ethical stimulation, but all of that is passive. So you're moving a person somehow, but you don't know if that's connecting the brain and the muscles. Proprioception is very important. We've heard about that before. But what if we actually close the loop again and we make the brain control this actuator, which is a robot or a functional electrical stimulation? So just to make it clear, so the brain normally controls the muscles and, sorry, and what you, hear, what you see is the activity, this is the uh, brain activity, in this case is EEG, and the bottom is the activity in the muscles, right? But when you get a stroke, the problem is that actually this activity is not passing that lesion. Of course, uh, there are some residual activity passing, but might not be enough. You can actually get some residual muscle activity, as you can see there. But just to summarize, we get it that into this closed loop neural interface. What we do is send these control commands to an exoskeleton, and here comes the key we are trying to use functional movements. These functional movements work the same way as it works with the kids, so you try to, plus, uh, to, to go through the star, through the star hole. This actually makes sense, and by doing that, you induce heavy learning, and this heavy learning, when, fires, uh, when cells fire together, wire together, we induce some plasticity, or we hope to induce some plasticity, this is uh, the hypothesis that we're using, and at some point, reconnect, again, brain and muscles. All right, this is very simple, as I say, but it's much more complicated if we go to the details. So to do that, we basically uh, tried first a non-invasive approach for the sake of safety, uh, and then we tried uh, on many patients, about 38 patients, uh, for a month of training, controlling with the brain activity of the EEG and exoskeleton. Here you can see an example. This patient is controlling with three channels of the EEG the movement of the exoskeleton, and we did that in a control. This was a randomized controlled trial um, that actually we had two groups, one group controlling with the brain the exoskeleton, and the other group thought they were controlling the exoskeleton, but we were moving that randomly. And we saw that only the experimental group improved significantly. And we saw that in the clinical scales, but also in fMRI data, in which actually we managed to do a laterality index again and also in the EMG activity. This is important because uh, after us, there's been a few groups reproducing our results, which is actually very good. Uh, that means that something is there, something is happening. Now our duty is, okay, can we leverage that? So as I said before, there is some residual EMG activity that can be found in some of the patients. Even if they cannot move, you can still see some little activity in the EMG. So even if they cannot move, we can still sense that. We can still use it to classify the intention that they have to, uh, to move. So basically, we can decode the movement with the, uh, with the muscle activity. So that we thought, OK, why not using that or use that as in a combination with the brain activity? Um, because we saw that, indeed, sometimes the intention to move or the EMG activity and what we could decode with the EEG, non-invasive technology, did not match. So maybe there are two different processes, they're not aligned, so we needed to see if that actually, with some invasive recordings, we can align them. Um, also, it's very important to know this EMG activity that we have, we know that the patients, they try to extend the muscle, uh, sorry, the arm, 
but they flex it because of these spasticity mechanisms and wrong synergies. So they try to move like that and actually end up doing this movement. So it's important that you have a map that translates correct activity, kinematics in this case, movements, with the activity on the other hand. But if you use the activity on the poetic side, you don't have a ground truth. You don't know what to do. So we basically recorded activity in the healthy side with the kinematics. We generated a translator, a decoder, and we just mirror it to the other side so that actually we can retrain properly this other arm. We saw that um, even if there was some residual activity in, the, in, the, in these patients, in the brain and in the muscles, the one, we could actually decode probably about 50% of the time with the EMG activity, their intention to move, so like I'm trying to move, I can decode that with the EMG. But if we use the brain activity, the percentage was much higher. So we could actually do a much better decode than with the EEG activity of only moving versus not moving. This is all non-invasive. Now the problem is, all right, let's mix it up. Let's do hybrid BMI in which we combine, it, we combine brain activity and muscle activity. And then we see if we can decode and improve that. This is the demonstrator uh, of the non-invasive version. Here is the patient controlling with one channel only, which is actually switching on and off the EMG control so that we are matched to align brain and muscles. And uh, this is basically a render of the movement of the, uh, the actual movement of the exoskeleton and the one that we are decoding. So basically, in this case, the, mo the robot is moving and we're in parallel decoding and see if actually we can decode the same movement. Uh, it is slower. There's a lot of artifacts. So is, we have a problem here, it's, just, it's not very practical. And we know that contingency and timing is very important for plasticity. So we decided to go invasive. And that's actually what Jose explained 10 years ago. Uh, we met, we decided to do this thing here. Why not basically do that? Uh, and that's exactly what we did. Of course, it's been a long process for the clinical trials, um, approval, et cetera, but we've been doing that. And for two years, we've been working on this. So um, last week was the second year anniversary of our first implant, and she's still working with us every day in an ambulatory regime. So basically, the patient goes home and comes back every second day to train with us. So here is the, the objective of the project, is to start with brain activity only, and then slowly, slowly build up muscle activity, share the control of the exoskeleton with more and more EMG activity, more and more muscle activity, until the patient can just basically move by herself. So it's a rehabilitation approach. It's not an assistive approach, it's a rehabilitation approach. And this is key, because with the technology that we have nowadays, we cannot expect to have it chronically implanted, but we can actually, and indeed we're proving it, have it for a while, and then remove it if we regain the activity, similar to what we've seen in the spinal cord injury patient.